few weeks, and that's one of the reasons, well, one of the reasons why I'm privileged to be on your show tonight, because the battle is now. The Senate bill is is a huge ramshackle. It's called the American Clean Energy Leadership Act. Well, they're throwing a bunch of stuff in it. Yeah, it's yeah. it's it's everything from coal to solar and politics and pork and pork in there. And nobody wants to make the other side look good, and nobody wants to look bad. You know, it's 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 the nastiest, lowest gutter level politics. Um, but embedded in this giant bill is a tiny little section, Section 301, that provides for protecting the power grid from, from cyber attacks. This doesn't say anything about solar electromagnetic pulse, but it's cyber attacks. So all we really need to do is get the Senate bill to expand and include the House language about protecting the power grid from solar, solar blasts. The language is already there. The House is passed unanimously. Um, and it will be a giant step toward protecting our way of life. Our this, daily this, life. this should be, Lawrence, a homeland security edict without legislation. They should simply say, we are doing this to protect this country and just do it. Why, why do we need legislation for this? Well, the, the utility industry, and I don't, I don't want to just set up a, you know, a, a – a uh, straw, straw horse villain here, but the utility industry is understandably. Let's let's try to let me try to be generous. Understandably reluctant to to have regulators interfere with their affairs. I mean, because the utility industry is this hodgepodge of public, private, cross-border, tri-state companies, authorities. You know, it's 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 hardly streamlined or, or centrally organized. And so there are many fiefdoms. I mean, it, it, the, the legal and political hurdles are much greater than financial ones. I mean, a couple hundred million bucks compared to what we've been throwing around is really not much. Um, but they, they have mounted a pretty effective campaign to keep it from the regulation from, from the order from simply being passed down, as you say, you know, let Homeland Security do it. But now, with a, a unanimous vote in the House, I and mean, the utility industry is going to have to fight awfully hard to keep it out of the Senate. But it's it's a tough battle because the Senate is so highly politicized that it's quite possible that this could be tabled for next year when there's a new Congress, when it would all have to start all over again. Lawrence, as you know, the sun is beginning to heat up. The activity is just starting at any time between now and through the next three or four years we could get hit directly with the next flare. We lucked out a few years ago because it went off to the side. We weren't faced directly to it. But it could happen. Lord, could it. Um, the, the largest flare in recorded history to have hit the Earth, and it's, uh, we haven't been recording them for that long, but a very large flare hit in 1859. It was called the Carrington Event. And um, if, that, if a flare of that size were to hit today, it would be pretty much the worst case scenario that I've described. 100 million people or so without electricity for months or years. And explain that people aren't going to get cooked when when a flare hits. No, you won't feel a thing. No, <laughs> uh, you won't feel a thing. And in fact, it will. Uh, the, here, here's what happens. Uh, the, there's a, a, a sunspot, which is a magnetic storm on the sun. It out. It, it issues an explosion, usually a billion ton blast of proton radiation, and and um, that travels. Uh, across the 93 million miles, it hits the Earth's protective magnetic field, but the big storms make their way through the magnetic field and inject energy into the ground. Only a few volts per square meter or, or per, yeah, I think it's three or four volts per square meter. It's mm -hmm. not much. I mean, it, you know, if you were standing there, you might feel a little buzz. You might feel nothing. It goes into the ground, and some of it comes up out of the, back out of the ground and cooks the transformers. And the transformers are what hold the grid together, and they are the vulnerable points in the grid. And when you cook a transformer like that, it's very bad news because you can't just send out the utility crew to fix them. They fuse solid. The copper windings fuse solid, so you have to replace these things. This is a problem. We have about 350 of the largest transformers. They weigh over 100 tons apiece, so you can't just stick them on an airplane. And we don't have a lot of backup, do we? There's... A, a one- to three-year waiting list on the world market for transformers, and currently none of the, the ones of, of that size are made in the United States. Amazing. So, 
we could really be held hostage. I mean, you know, uh, it's it's not far fetched at all to imagine the the prices soaring and 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 not just in money but in tribute and in 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 in, in every way. Anyone who saw that they could take advantage of the United States, that would be the time. Not to mention our our more violent enemies. And satellites would get hit first, right? Satellites get hit first, but ironically, they are better protected uh, than the power grid is against these solar blasts because the satellite designers were more aware of, of space conditions. So They've insulated most of them, right? Yes, they, yeah, but the, guess what? The satellites won't be any help if they can't report to the ground. If the, if the, you know, the, ground, the ground bases don't have electricity satellites aren't going to do anything for us. So in spite of everything that, uh, you know, I mentioned as I introduced you and that we're going to talk about tonight, you see the EMP blasts uh, primarily from the sun could happen from another rogue country, who knows, that has a nuke. But you see that as the biggest problem facing us as we get into 2012? I do. I really do. Because it's going to happen whether it happens in 2012, which, again, is the next red zone time of, of solar blasts, whether it happens then or, or, or sometime soon, not only is it, is it mind-boggling uh, how bad it would be for us, but, you know, I'm a practical guy, and it's something that we can do something about. We can protect ourselves. If the Yellowstone supervolcano blows, we can't stop it from blowing. We can't give the thing an antacid, you know? I mean, there's not much we can do. We can prepare civil defense, and all of that is good and important, but we can't stop it from happening. This we can stop from happening. And, and mayhem aside, wouldn't we kick ourselves all the way to hell if, if, if we had it within our grasp, within our budget, within our technology to protect ourselves and our, our way of life and didn't do it? Oh, uh, absolutely. Are there other countries protecting them themselves? Well, the United States is particularly vulnerable because um, our grid, our transformers handle very high voltages. And the ones that handle the highest voltages are the ones that are most vulnerable to these blasts. For example, we run up to 725,000 volts per transformer at, at the, the highest level, whereas in Europe, they've kept it down to around 400,000 volts. And those transformers are, can have a little bit more latitude to absorb a few extra volts of direct current that would come in from a solar blast. China, however, runs at about, runs some at a million uh, volts per transformer, and that renders them even more susceptible. Bad news is that the higher the latitude, the closer you are to the poles, in our case the North Pole, the more vulnerable you are to solar blasts because the Earth's magnetic field is weaker at the poles. So we happen to be, unfortunately, ideally, and I do say that ironically, suited to, for, to have our, our, our way of life disrupted, not to say that other places are immune. In 1989, there was um, a, a solar blast that may be about a tenth the size of the great 1859 one or the one in 1921, which was also huge. And it knocked out Hydro-Quebec um, utility for oh, yeah. nine hours. That people have, have talked about, but what we – rarely here reported is it also fried 14 transformers in South Africa. And that country struggled for years to regain its, its, its electrical utilities. I know I have friends in South Africa, and they, they've been having lights out for, 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 for years since then. Lawrence, stay with us. We'll be back. We'll talk more about this. Also, Planet X, get your take on that and much more on Coast to Coast AM. And tonight we're talking with journalist and science consultant Lawrence Joseph about his latest work, Aftermath. What happens around 2012? We'll be back in a moment with Lawrence on Coast to Coast AM. Lawrence, uh, you had gone to South Africa to meet with scientists who were researching the uh, crumbling Earth's magnetic field. Tell me a little bit about that trip. Yes. Um, I went to South Africa to work with scientists at the Hermanus Magnetic Observatory, um, both because they had a good reputation for their research uh, on the Earth's magnetic field, but more important because they're living under what is known as the South Atlantic Anomaly, basically a California-sized crack in the Earth's magnetic field. And I wanted to talk to, to people whose, whose butts were on the line, yeah. you know, uh, who's, who are raising their families there and who are, who are living there, and we're, we're not in um, some ivory tower removed from the situation. And I went there, and um, 